we're going to check out the fall of Constantinople in 1453 when the Ottomans finally took the holy city by kings and generals, one of the best history channels on uh, YouTube, at least in my opinion. I'll give my input as well from what I know. I have a little bit of uh, background in this. I have a bachelor's in history. The Ottoman Empire attempted to besiege Constantinople and end the Byzantine Empire on a half dozen occasions. That's true. They did try to destroy the uh, Byzantine Empire on a half dozen occasions. Just a few years before, well actually a few decades before, when the Ottoman Interregnum happened, the only reason the uh, Byzantines are still alive is because of the Interregnum. If the Interregnum, which is basically a civil war in the Ottoman Empire, if that didn't happen, the Byzantines would be gone by 1453 for sure. But these sieges were interrupted by the Crusades, civil wars, rebellions, and the invasion of Timur. Exactly. Crusades and civil wars and Timur as well. The Ottomans consolidated their territory and finally entered a period of internal stability. The next siege of Constantinople was imminent. Sultan Murad II defeated the European Crusaders at the Battle of Varna. The King of Poland and Hungary, Władysław, was killed during the battle, and that plunged the most powerful states in Central Europe into a crisis. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's also why the game EU4 starts in 1444, because of the Crusade of Varna. It literally starts one day after the Crusade of Varna. And the reality is that it, the Crusade of Varna and the after effect had a massive impact on the political map of Europe for years to come. If the Crusade was successful, they likely would have pushed the Ottomans out of the Balkans afterwards. They really would have done that, or at least would have liberated Bulgaria for sure. The latter sent numerous letters to the Pope and the kings of Europe, calling them to another crusade. But since no one was willing, his activity was limited to raiding into Ottoman territory. The white knight Janos Huniadi, Janku de Hunedoara as we call him in Romanian, he was originally from the province of Huniadi, which is right over here on the map, you can see it. There's even the castle here, Castello Corvinilor, his family castle. Basically, his son, Matthias Corvinus, became the king of Hungary. This is their original holdings in Transylvania. Look how beautiful this is. Some people say that they were Romanians. Some people say they were Hungarians. What we do know 100% is that whatever the case, Matthias Corvinus, king of Hungary, he spoke Hungarian. Likely his mom was Hungarian and his dad, Janko de Hunedoara or Janos Hudiadi, he likely was Romanian descent that became Catholic so he can actually own lands in Transylvania because back then the only nobility that was allowed to own lands was if they were Catholic, not Orthodox, and Romanians were Orthodox. So even if he was Romanian, he did convert to Catholicism and he spoke Hungarian. Maybe he was mixed himself, you never know. The reality is we really will never know the truth about this. But the point is there's definitely some Romanian origins to this. As Skanderbeg was previously an Ottoman vassal, Murad sent three punitive expeditions against him. But all three armies were ambushed and defeated by the outnumbered Albanian forces. I like how they keep showing uh, Total War, Attila Total War 1212 AD mod battles. Like all of these are recorded with the Attila Total War mod. Meanwhile, the Sultan was preoccupied with minor rebellions within the empire and a campaign against the Despotate of Moria in 1446. During the campaign in Greece, Murad forced the ruler of Moria and future Byzantine Emperor Constantine XI to become his vassal and pay tribute. The Ottomans in general, they really wanted to take Constantinople for a long time. The Byzantines pretty much did everything they could in their power, politically speaking, to prevent that from happening. They paid so much tribute and tried to appease the Ottomans, but the inevitable would always would have happened. Meanwhile, Hunyadi was preparing another crusade. By September of 1448, he finally raised a 30,000 strong army and started a new campaign. He was hoping that the despot of Serbia, Juraj Branković, would join him, but the latter was an Ottoman vassal and refused, so instead, Serbian lands were raided. Murad knew about all this and started moving his army to prevent Skanderbeg and Hunyadi from joining forces. Not only did Durad refuse to help Hunyadi, but after the Second Battle of Kosovo, Durad pretty much took Hunyadi as prisoner. On the 17th of October, the Sultan and his 50,000 troops reached the site where the First Battle of Kosovo between Lazar and Murad I took place. On the first day of the ensuing battle, Hungarian, Polish, Wallachian and Moldovan forces attacked the Ottomans across the front with their armoured troops. 
One of the big advantages that the Ottomans had in the 15th century is the fact that they actually had a lot of lightly armored and fast mobile units from their origins of, you know, migrating people. But they also had medium mediumly armored and equipped weapon wise infantry and cavalry so they had a good mix of maneuverability and shock power especially the yanni series were insane man but despite early successes were pushed back Hinyadi attempted to use his light cavalry to attack the ottoman flanks during the night but the ottoman light horsemen intercepted and repelled the crusaders on the second day murad ordered his flanks to retreat and that tricked Hinyadi. His troops attacked the Ottoman center head-on and were able to push the Ottoman light infantry back. However, the Janissaries stopped the Crusader advance near the Sultan's position. It was not a new concept. A lot of people think that the Janissaries were a new concept, but they were not. Janissaries was a concept that was around in the Mamluk times. Like the Mamluks themselves, they were slave soldiers essentially that took over the kingdom. And the Byzantines had a sort of system like that as well, similar, not exactly the same, but similar. And what I was going to say is also the fact that the Balkan units were super similar to the Ottoman units in the 15th century, especially Valachian units units and Transylvanian units and Serbian ones almost identical to them the only difference is they didn't have Yanni series obviously and the Hungarians had a little bit more heavy infantry than um, the rest of the Balkan countries and uh, Hunyadi he did like to employ units from everywhere in, in Europe in the Balkans especially so he liked to employ units from R the Valachians from uh, the Serbs and so on At this point the Ottoman flanks returned to the battle and encircled Hunyadi's forces the leader of the crusading army managed to retreat, but more than half of his troops were killed, while the Ottomans lost around 5,000 men. That's massive casualties, man. For those times, that's massive casualties. When Murad II passed away, and his son Mehmed II came to power in 1451, his singular goal was to take the Byzantine capital. Mehmed was pretty much set on taking Constantinople. He knew that if he took Constantinople, he's going to go down in history as the one that took Constantinople. Constantinople was not the city it once was. The total number of the population was now between 50 and 100,000 and vast swathes of land within the walls were empty. To put this into comparison, 150 years before, in the 1300s, it would have been half a million people in Constantinople still. The Byzantine Emperor, Constantine XI, now controlled only a small territory along the coast and had to pay tribute to the Ottoman Sultan. Constantine XI was hoping to end the practice of paying tribute to the Sultan and threatened to support Mehmed's cousin Orhan in claiming the Ottoman throne. That's the final straw for Mehmed. That's kind of what triggered Mehmed's desire to take Constantinople. Obviously, he, he wanted to take it from before. This is basically his casus belli, his real reason to go to war, right? Because that guy, he actually had legitimate claim to the Ottoman throne if he really wanted to go for that, right? And it was the only one aside from Mehmed that had that legitimacy to the throne. And he knew it's a problem, so he, he had to take him out. There's actually an interesting story about him. Uh, despite being a part of the Ottoman royal family, let's call it, right? He did fight for the Byzantines and he died defending Constantinople. That's really interesting. With his Turkish soldiers, there were Turkish soldiers defending Constantinople against the Ottoman Empire. Because everybody, when we think about the Ottoman Empire, we think, oh, Turks. No, it's not Turks. The Ottomans were not Turks. Obviously, the majority and the royalty were Turks. But it was a mixture, especially in 1440-something. Probably half Turkish, half Greek, and so on, you know? They were not 100% Turks in 1440. In April of 14. 52, the Sultan gave orders to build a fortress called Rimele Hizar on the northern end of the Bosphorus to prevent any ships from assisting Constantinople from the Black Sea. The fort was built by the end of August, and Constantine had no other choice but to start bringing his subjects into the city, storing up supplies, and sending pleas for help to the European states while most Christian monarchs ignored the pleas. The Ottomans had more than 100,000 warriors, 69 cannons, and 126 ships under the overall command of Mehmed II against 7,000 professional Byzantine troops. These numbers are not accurate, by the way. According to a variety of sources, the numbers are very different. If you go and check Ottoman sources, they are very different. If you check Byzantine sources, if you check European sources, everybody says different numbers. The reality is that in this time frame, and realistically speaking, Mehmed would not need 100,000 soldiers to siege Constantinople. Like, look at this. It says that Constantinople had 7,000 soldiers and 30,000 peasants, right? Reality 
idea is that he would probably need 50,000 maximum to siege Constantinople and anything above 50,000 would not be economically speaking logical because the logistics to have 100,000 soldiers siege down one city that has 37,000 defenders is not feasible. This number from the Ottoman side was probably 50, 60,000 and the Byzantines probably this maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. I'm not saying the Ottomans would not have 100,000. The Ottomans probably could muster 200,000 in 14. 53 but they would not do it for sieging one city it makes no sense logically it's it would be too much money spending for these soldiers and for like feeding them and everything and for the siege itself one of the ottoman guns was particularly big and would play an iconic role in the upcoming siege that would be uh the hungarian bombard cannon the defenders repaired the walls and a chain was set across the golden horn. This is actually extremely smart. So the reason they set the chain across the golden, golden horn here is basically to prevent the Ottomans from coming in with their superior larger fleet into here. They cannot go if there's a massive chain connecting the two sides, right? Really smart and like very basic way of denying maneuverability for the enemies. But the Ottomans, what they did is they actually went with the ships over land. So they built like a, a medieval style railway to get the ships across land to come into the Golden Horn. The vanguard of the Ottoman army arrived at the walls of Constantinople on April 1st, 1453, and began making camp the next day. The Sultan reached the city on the 5th of April and started preparing to besiege it. The giant Ottoman cannons were in place on the 6th and started blasting the Theodosian walls, but with little effect. On the 7th, the Sultan ordered his light infantry and skirmishers to assault the walls but the defenders easily repelled the Ottomans. The Byzantines attempted a few sallies on the 8th and 9th. That's so brave on their side, like, you know that you're massively outnumbered and you still attempt to do a couple of sallies. That just shows whoever was left in the defense of uh, Constantinople at that time, they were diehard defenders that knew that they're fighting till death. They knew there's no retreat. This is the last city. There's nothing else afterwards. It's the last stop. Fight until death. That's insane when you think about it. The Ottomans started battering the city walls on the 11th and this bombardment continued until the very end of the siege. On the water, the Ottoman fleet was unable to penetrate the chain and move into the Golden Horn. On the contrary, a few Venetian ships arrived and joined the defenders on the 20th of April. Imagine seeing the Venetians coming to help you out must have given them a pretty big morale boost. He famously ordered his ships to be moved across land near the Genoese colony of Pera. The ships were then set to water in the Golden Horn, behind the chain. Yeah, this is what I was saying before. This is literally what I was saying. They took them over by land across. That's just massive brain right there. The logistics to do this alone in that period must have been insane. Constantine sent his fire ships to quickly get rid of this threat, but the defenders lost this battle. From now on, Constantine had to keep at least part of his troops on the northern wall. Yeah, that's really bad because imagine you have to take half, maybe 30% of your troops, you have to take them to defend the northern wall from an invasion from that area. That's a massive debuff to your defense capabilities. On May 6th, Ottoman cannons managed to destroy the gates of St. Romanus, and during the night, their forces almost breached the defenses in the area. But Justiniani arrived and fended off the attackers. On the 11th, the Cal Chad Genoese right here, boys, Chad Genoese. They don't make Genoese people like they used to, you know? And the Ottomans moved in towards the Blackerne Palace, but the Emperor was able to push them back. The Ottoman Sultan commanded an all-out assault on the 29th. A massive bombardment was followed by a light infantry assault, but despite numerical advantage, they failed to take the walls from Justiniani. And you know why? Even though they had more numbers, they failed to take the walls because these guys were fighting for their lives, dude. When you have that kind of zeal in your mind, you fight differently, trust me. Artillery destroyed part of the gates near the gates of St. Romanus, and 3,000 Janissaries were sent to attack this position. The Byzantines were able to defend once again, but the Janissaries took one of the towers and planted the Ottoman flag. And when a few hundred Janissaries entered the city near the gates of St. Romanus, the Byzantine defenses fell. Citizens and defenders attempted to board the ships and leave the city. Sources say that the Emperor and his last that guards attempted a desperate counterattack near the gates of St. Romanus, but he was killed. 
about the emperor himself, there's uh, three legends about him. Well, there's three versions of what happened. One version is that he tried to go back and uh, retake the gate, fight off the Ottomans, but he was killed in the process and obviously he didn't succeed. Another one is that he got captured by the Ottomans and he got killed off. And another one is that he actually managed to escape with the people that did escape uh, via the ships. Some of them managed to make it to the ships and escape. A small percentage did. Who knows which source we can trust. The reality is likely none of those sources know the real thing that happened. That was a good video. I encourage you guys to check out their channel, Kings and Generals. Really good uh, documentaries. And if you guys want to see more React content like this, check out this other video over here.